Okay, you might be wondering why I'm sitting in the dark. I'm in the bathroom, obviously, because it's the darkest place in my house, and it's not nightfall yet, uh, because I couldn't wait to show you my new project, which is this guy. And yeah, this is exactly what it looks like. It's uh, basically a laser-cut version of a kumiko, I believe that's how you pronounce it, uh, like a Japanese paper lantern. And I believe Chinese have something similar as well, just the patterns might be slightly different. But anyway, yeah, you can see I have a candle flicker mode. And if you press and hold, you can actually change the intensity. There's a touch sensor on the front, and you can even turn off the flicker. So this is just on a static, and there's five levels of brightness for each. This is the brightest. And then this is the lowest flicker. And that level just looks fantastic to me. And there's four different patterns. There's a fish scale pattern, some kind of flower leaf pattern, just simple geometric triangles. And on the back side is uh, like a cube lattice. And on the top, it's just a very traditional looking kind of paper window sort of look there. But yeah, this looks absolutely fantastic. And I'm going to show you exactly how I designed and made this. So let's get into it. from this video sponsor. Got an idea for a circuit, widget, or device that you want to rapid prototype or sell? Check out JLC PCB. They offer their board manufacturing services starting at two bucks for five boards and only take a few days from start to finish. Log into the link in the description. Here you can upload your board files, select options like color, quantity, and even special features, complete the order process, and if your boards pass validation checks, then they'll immediately begin manufacture upon payment and shipping selection. So make sure to check out JLC PCB. And once again, thanks for making this video possible. Now let's get on with the video. Okay, I'm just gonna say this is one of the very rare few projects that turns out exactly how I imagined it in my head. Okay, so here we are on the bench and let me go through the design process of this lamp a little bit first before I show you what's inside of it. So, I might make these videos look kind of easy and, oh, I designed this and it worked the first time. Well, it didn't, <laughs> in a nutshell. So, with any new tool, it takes a little bit of, of learning and getting used to. So, I printed off, or not printed, I cut off a good, like, five or six boards that all failed for different reasons, and I learned from each of the mistakes. Uh... So, <laughs> I think this was one of the worst failures. Uh, yeah, if, if you don't secure the board down while you're you're cutting it, because uh, my laser cutter in particular only has about two millimeters of clearance from the surface uh, in order to set the focal point uh, correctly. So this guy, what ended up happening was uh, it got caught on something and it shifted. And so yeah, you could see an interesting pattern on the back where it did poke through. And then, yeah, as it got skewed, it, I think it moved it around a few times. And I was off trying to do something else, and I was not keeping an eye on it. And that's a bad thing to do. Uh, another thing was, uh, yeah, if, if you cut, uh, you can leave... This I ended up reusing just to test, you know, different squares to see what the uh, how many passes and what speed I should set it at to kind of optimize. But uh, you can see on this first one, it actually um, skipped a step. I had it driven uh, too fast, and I guess it just uh, lost a step or something gained a step. I don't know. And yeah, and another thing to note is uh, I learned to put uh, this blue painter's tape on because you can actually see um, some of the areas are there's a uh, charring outside of cuts. So blue painter's tape actually helped immensely, and then you just peel it off after you're done, and it comes off very easily as well. And the laser cutter can cut right through it with no problems. And yeah, and I had a couple more failures due to uh, the 
the uh, wood moving after I, I was done cutting. And so, yeah. And this one, I think, was an early failure. You can see the wood that I bought. This is from the dollar store, so you, you can see what kind of uh, materials I'm dealing with. But yeah, a lot of this wood is quite bowed. Uh, you can see a lot of them are kind of bent, I guess, like concave. So the edges stick up. And what I ended up doing was I actually added some more tape. I, I didn't have like a proper setup where I can actually screw something down to secure it. So I just ended up using tape, but then I didn't really think about it. But uh, the laser would cut through the tape, so it would have very small surface area. So a lot of these just popped up anyway. So what I ended up doing was just putting more tape along the sides and holding the whole thing down. Just like wrapping it like it were in a straight jacket. And that ended up working pretty well. But yeah, I have all these scrap pieces of wood. These will not go to waste. I'll actually use them. I'll probably just flip them over and use them for uh, for dialing in like engraving settings and, and cut settings and that kind of stuff. So yeah, nothing goes to waste. But yeah, uh, I think it was a dollar for six boards. So this is like almost a dollar wasted. Well, not really wasted, but yeah, an invaluable experience in learning how to use a, a laser, like a dialed laser cutter. So there is that. And... One of the first, I, I think this was the first successful one that I cut. Uh, it, it is still, actually it's very bowed, you can see there. It's not even straight, holy. But anyway, uh, I just use this as a test. Because this one I did not put uh, blue painter's tape on. So there's like significant charring. And it's not really even, not so great looking. Uh, but I just use this to test how to glue the paper down. And I tried glue stick, like some of this, like, you know, purple glue stick that turns white while it dries. It sort of works, but not so great. And it leaves clumps uh, that are uneven. What actually worked really well was also from the dollar store. <laughs> uh, just a big old bottle of just regular water soluble school glue. And I watered it down. Uh, in like a little ceramic dish like this, I just poured a bunch of it, put a little bit of water to water it down, and then I applied the glue using this like foam brush, also from the dollar store. Now I'm just realizing like most of this video is not just sponsored by JLC, but also the dollar store indirectly. Anyway, I just uh, applied it all over, uh, just like a thin layer. And I let it set up, get a little bit tacky, and then I put the paper down. You can see it kind of did get an, a little bit uneven, so eh. Uh, I'm sure there's a better way if I had uh, some spray adhesive that probably would have worked. Like tacky spray adhesive would have worked much better. Uh, and another issue that I was having was... Uh, when I was gluing the sheets together, because like I said, they're all slightly bent... Uh, I had to um, glue them. I used wood glue um, along the sides. And to get it kind of to stick in the corners, I used a little bit of super glue. Uh, just some of this stuff. And that worked really well because it sets up fast and, it, you know, you don't have to hold it. Uh, it just tacked the corners down. So while I waited for the rest of the glue all along the edges to dry, then that would at least hold it. Uh, but the unfortunate thing is it actually soaked into the paper, so uh, some of the spots when when you're looking at this close up are slightly more translucent in the corners where I use the super glue. So in retrospect, I would if I did this project again, I just wouldn't use super glue. Also, I wish I'd spend a little more time uh, sanding the edges so that you wouldn't see the darker material. Uh, that's just an aesthetic thing. And yeah, and. You can see in certain areas, the wood is actually not quite, like in this corner, it's actually set inset a little bit too much because the wood is slightly curved, uh, so it doesn't match exactly. Uh, it's good enough when you're looking at it head on, you won't even notice that, but if you run your fingernail there, you can see definitely there's like a little bit of a gap. It doesn't match up exactly perfectly. And yeah, um, other than that, just give you a nice close-up of uh, the different sides. This is the flower side. These are like scales or waves or Wi-Fi symbols, if, if that's what you're into. Uh, we have geometric cubes, which I really like this side. Uh, it's one of the sides where more light, because there's less wood lattice work, more light actually transmits. So this side's brighter than some of the other sides. For instance, uh, the Wi-Fi symbol side or scale side uh, has a lot more wood. 
so less light actually makes it through this side but i think this pattern looks really interesting and happy medium of just random triangles uh, and yeah and for the top i went with this kind of very traditional paper lantern kind of um thing going on there and that looks simple but you know pretty elegant uh yeah and that's about it uh i guess nothing to do but to pop these open uh so this bottom you can see i spent quite a bit of time measuring everything to make sure that i could get uh the the placement of the usb port just spot on and I, uh, I even modeled it in CAD, the actual PCB, and to make sure it would fit and I can get uh, tolerances pretty tight. And that's where this guy comes in. I did the same thing that I did on several other projects where I, I designed the model for what I wanted to print. And then to make sure that it fits, I, uh, with Incura, I actually dropped it below the, uh, the platform in the... Uh, the slicer and it'll only render like you know the top part of it so I can check the clearance around just the top portion of it and that's actually a really good tip then you don't have to print out the whole thing and then realize your tolerances were wrong which happened to me because this is actually quite loose uh, what I usually do when I design for something is I'll add you know certain amount of clearance between one part that has to fit inside of another part and for this, I did a offset, but I forgot that I should have done an offset by half of the clearance because it'll do an offset on both sides. So I ended up using 0.5 millimeter clearance, which for my printer is usually pretty good enough uh, to give a fairly snug, but not like too hard to insert uh, clearance. But it ended up being one millimeters because it did 0.5 and then 0.5 on the other side. So this part is too loose. It, it, it'll fit, but it, it won't actually, you know, be removed. It'll be a little bit too loose. If you were to see here, it wiggles around a little bit too much there. So I ended up um, setting the offset clearance to 0.25. So it would be 0.5, you know, all around. So that worked actually pretty well. And you can see here exactly how I'm accomplishing the uh, the touch sensor. And I just pulled out of my scrap box this random shielding for something that I took apart. And I cut a little bit of sheet of uh, that copper uh, tape. And then I just soldered a wire to it. And I taped it on the other side of where the, po the power symbol was engraved. And that was good enough. And this... The um, the rest of the fit on this was actually really tight, so uh, I printed out some posts that the PCB actually snaps into, and the tolerances on those were a little bit tight, so I actually had to uh, you know use a flat piece of metal and then a hammer to lightly kind of press fit onto those studs. So this PCB is not going to come out easily. I would probably either destroy the base or the PCB trying. So in the models that I will be uploading, I've already decreased the diameter of those posts to make it a little bit easier uh, so that you'll get a snug fit, but it won't require like, you know, hammering to the point where you're uncomfortable and you feel like you're going to break it, uh, which was the case for this. But yeah, the circuit is actually really simple. So we have our USB port in the back here. Uh, the board juts out so that the port is uh, nearly flush with the front. It's a little bit inset, but just a tiny bit. And uh, we have a connector here in case you wanted to use a battery. I just added them. And, and also, you know, for testing, you could just uh, put a header on there or whatever. Uh, other than that, I have a electrolytic decoupling cap on the 5-volt rail. And just pretty much one chip. Here's a in-circuit serial programming header for the ATtiny84, uh, which is the microcontroller running this show. You can see there's no crystal oscillator. I'm using the internal oscillator on this chip, and all that I really need is a decoupling cap. And I added a 10K pulp resistor on the reset line. I've since learned that uh, these chips actually have an internal pull-up on their reset, so you actually that's redundant. You don't technically need that, but it adds just a little bit. You know, it doesn't hurt anything, and it adds some noise stability to the circuit so it doesn't just randomly reset if there's you know fluctuation on the power input there is four uh, BJT's in this case I'd originally used MOSFETs and then I forgot to put pull down resistors so uh, when you first plug this in when it wasn't driving those the uh, lights would flash like randomly 
and I did not like that, so I switched them to NPN, so it'll only turn on when you turn it on. Uh, additionally, I have, I bought, uh, let's see here. So a pack of 50 warm white LEDs. And originally I was just going to go with, I was going to say, screw it, just use cold white LEDs because I have tons of cold white LEDs, but not really any warm white ones that I could use. Uh, but I'm so glad I went with the warm white. It looks a lot more convincing as like a candle using the warm whites over the cold whites. Uh, so they're three millimeter uh, ones and I just have them stood off about an inch from the board. Uh, it's not really any, I didn't, really calculate anything uh, I just sort of went with the flow of what felt right to try to get the lights just kind of starting at the bottom here so that they would diffuse as the light traveled upwards uh, one thing that I found interestingly enough um, there was a short um, on the PCB uh, when I was designing it I had messed up and I and it somehow made it through uh, the DFM checks and whatnot and I did not notice that uh, basically the resistor for this LED uh, was, you know, shorted. <laughs> so this LED was fed by um, by five volts without any resistance to limit the current. So this LED, when I first soldered this together, is is significantly brighter than all the other three, and I thought that was kind of weird. And after running it for a short while, not even like a minute, uh, it, it started flickering and it burnt out pretty much. So I traced it and I found out, yeah, the resistor wasn't doing anything in the circuit. So what I ended up doing was I bodged, I didn't solder it to the other pad. I lifted the, the uh, I, well, I soldered in a new LED, obviously. And then I lifted the positive lead on the LED and soldered it straight to resistor and then straight to the, uh, the collector on the NPN transistor. So that's bypassing you know, the pad here, which was supposed to go only to the LED, but it goes to VCC uh, because of a wiring mistake that I made. So anyway, I fixed that on the PCB. Uh, there shouldn't be any issues with that if you download the files uh, that are going to be linked in the description. So yeah, uh, in a nutshell, all this board does is it reads the touch sensor every once in a while. I think something like every, you know, 10 times a second, something like that and it'll generate uh, PWM for the four channels and they're all independent. And uh, there's two modes on this. It'll do either constant PWM, so it'll just set the output at a fixed level of brightness. There's five levels of brightness. And then if you switch it beyond that, then it starts going to five levels of candle flicker. And the way that the candle flicker works is it's pseudo random and there's a like a base offset brightness and then it adds a random plus minus uh, whatever the 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 RAND function outputs. So in that way, I can modulate it. I can have a certain set level of brightness that it modulates around. And so uh, that's generally how that works. It's pseudo random, so it's always seated by the same value. So technically, every time you fire this up, it will show the exact same output. Uh, but it has such a large variance, and there are four of them, and the way that the light um, is random kind of between all the LEDs as well as kind of the random diffusion going on. It's really hard to tell. I haven't been able to notice like any uh, distinct pattern while this is running. Uh, I'm sure if you sat there and stared at it and analyzed it, uh, so you might start to see some kind of like linear uh, shift register feedback sort of determinism or something, but meh, good enough for me. So yeah, pretty simple PCB, pretty simple construction, just a little uh, wire going down to there and everything just sort of tucks in there. The base is pretty simple. It only took me, I want to say like an hour to print, something like that. Uh, it doesn't use a lot of plastic and I think it looks pretty smart. So it would have been nice. I do have wood filament and I, it really did cross my mind to print this out in wood filament, but there wouldn't be really a great contrast between the, the base and the rest of the wood. So I figured having something simple still remaining simple so like a simple solid gray uh, aesthetically looks pretty nice to me and another thing that I did was I added little fillets all around all the sides and the bottom uh, to try to help with elephant footing my uh, printer does have pretty bad elephant footing just to get the adhesion uh, and so there's a little bit of one but it's not like super bad if you were to look at this close up, you'll notice, and if, especially if you run your finger on, on along the edge, uh, but 
just from a distance it, it looks pretty clean and sheer so yeah and that's basically it if you guys are interested all the design files for everything the dxf files for all the faces that i have uh, will be provided and i'll provide the solidworks files as well so if you want to modify the designs i believe i have a template of just a blank center and you can change you can add whatever pattern you want in the center uh, and that's actually how I redesigned each face is I started from that template file and then I saved it as a new file and I edited it. So yeah. And so if you're interested, I have also some other variants of the top layer, um, the top lid. If you wanted to try, I, I have one that's more Chinese inspired. It's, it looks like little octagons. Uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, this project was one of the very rare projects that... Um, I have usually I'll have an idea in my head and I'll start sketching things out and imagining how it would work or look and oftentimes it doesn't come out the way that I imagined in a project it very rarely does this is one of the projects that the first time I powered this on once I finished it it looked exactly how I pictured it in my mind and for that I was actually really happy the only thing I might do to improve this if I were to do this again well Next time I pop this open and I have my laptop with me, I'm going to increase the sensitivity on the touch button because I noticed uh, you do have to kind of press a little firmer than I'd like. So that'll definitely help. And it would actually help if you put like a little metal pin or something and had that soldered to the wire, then the sensitivity would be significantly higher than just through the wood. But I think I'm just going to increase the sensitivity in software, which is easy enough for me to do. Uh, to counter that. I did notice, so if you're running this off of USB from a battery pack, it works flawlessly. There's no issue. I notice if you plug it into like a power brick, uh, depending on the power brick, some of them are kind of noisy on their output and that affects the touch, the, uh, touch sensitivity. So it's sort of hit or miss. I, I tried with my, um, my phone charger that I have by my bedside and it seems to kind of be a little wacky whether it'll detect your touches or sometimes it'll just flicker on and off randomly with that but I haven't had any issues with a, uh, a power brick so I'm guessing it's just my adapter is um, you know maybe there's too much noise on its output or something like that or maybe the load on this is too low and it's doing some kind of weird sense thing on its output for like power delivery this turned out absolutely fantastic and I'm, I'm really happy with this and so if you guys want to build your own everything is going to be available just you know go at it uh, I think what I would suggest um, you can definitely cut all these on a diode laser it took about an hour for each side with the exception of the top only took about like 10 or 15 minutes uh, but yeah that's like what four hours four and a half hours something like that total just of cutting and that's not counting the failures so if you are going to cut this i would almost suggest sending it off or if you have a co2 laser cutter it would cut through this three mil uh wood like butter so i would probably actually opt next time for um getting this done on a co2 laser not a diode laser uh, the diode laser works it just takes significantly longer you can imagine uh, each of these cuts has to be done eight times for my diode laser on 100% power to actually fully penetrate the wood. So that's a lot of time cutting, <laughs> you can imagine, especially something like this where there's so many tiny little intricate cuts. And like this side too is like really, you know, it, every single cut adds up. And so it takes a significant amount of time with the diode laser. Whereas if you have a CO2 laser, it just cuts in one pass and you're good to go. And so, yeah, a huge thanks to JLCPCB for making it possible for me to make these videos. For this project, all the parts were cheap, but generally uh, on most projects, I usually spend like around a hundred bucks uh, in terms of parts. And that's not counting my time or anything like that. That's just in terms of like the, the bomb. In this case, I'd only spent maybe like a couple dollars <laughs> overall, plus the LEDs was were like, what, maybe five bucks, a bag of 50 of them, and I only used four. And I destroyed one, unfortunately. But yeah, so in terms of this, this was mostly a time commitment because it took me a good, you know, I don't know, like a month or something of cutting because I would cut one board and it would fail and then I would be discouraged and I'd have to put this down and just walk away 
And on top of that, I had to wait for LEDs to arrive. These guys took like two or three weeks because they got lost in the mail like the first two times. <laughs> and another thing, um, when you're gluing like these wood pieces together, it actually would have helped if I had like, uh, you know, corner squares or something to, to line it up. All I ended up doing was using blue painters tape and taping all the sides together and kind of trying to square it up by eye the best I could. So there are some gaps. It's not perfect. Um, you can see, you know, quite a number of gaps actually. Uh, so yeah, this process could have be basically been a lot better if I were a better woodworker, but I'm, I'm not a woodworker. I'm an electronics and programming guy. So, but I think if I were to build another one, it would get progressively better and better in terms of the quality of, uh, the glue up and everything like that. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.